This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Heart and Vascular Grand Rounds. Uh, thank you for joining. It is my pleasure to introduce one of our own, uh, Dr. Aslam Billen. Uh, Dr. Billen went to medical school in Ankara, Turkey, uh, where she had several notable awards and accomplishments. Uh, she subsequently went to residency in internal medicine at Baylor and stayed for a year uh, doing a, a lipid fellowship uh, at Baylor, uh, followed by a clinical cardiology fellowship here at Emory. And I'm glad that she stayed on as faculty. Uh, she's been on for about a year and a half now. Um, Azam has published several papers related to coagulopathy, uh, thrombosis, and also lipids and primary prevention. She's been very active in our residency and fellowship teaching, and has also taken on several projects during her first year, uh, including um, a, a developing sort of an echo registry uh, at Emory and also a registry of uh, Hokum patients. That's where her, her interests are. Uh, she's represented us well in the, at the ACC uh, Jeopardy competition in 2019. And I just remember thinking, wow, Aslam is so brave. She was up there representing Emory. Um, and uh, she is very active in the women in cardiology group. And it's uh, just very exciting to have you here. So I'll turn it over to you, Aslam. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Pooja. Good morning, everyone. Awesome. Hope everyone had a wonderful weekend. So today we're going to go through hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which truly is a story in evolution. I do not have any conflict of interest regarding today's topic. And so I will initially review the current literature that has looked into the medical therapies, the guideline directed medical therapies that we're using in symptomatic management of patients with HCM. And now we're gonna review the pathophysiology of HCM. And then eventually I am hoping to introduce you guys some disease modifying therapies, um, namely Mavacamten, that has targeted the pathophysiology of HCM. So let us start off with a clinical case. This was a, let's see. Okay, so this was a 25-year-old gentleman who presented with progressive dyspnea. And as you can see, his echo here shows significant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, severe asymmetric septal hypertrophy with a septum of about three centimeter. He had systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve causing significant LVO2 obstruction. And he had an LVO2 gradient at rest of about 100 millimeter mercury. Given he had significant symptoms, we had started on low dose beta blocker did not tolerate higher doses because of his young age, and he had persistent symptoms on a beta blocker. So as a second line agent, he was also started on disapyramide. With that, he had significant anticholinergic side effects and continued to have persistent symptoms as well. So about a year later, he was offered septal myomectomy, which he underwent successfully with significant reduction in his allegotic gradients and symptoms. Unfortunately, about eight years later, he developed burned out hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with an EF of 25%, ended up getting a CRTD. Today he is alive and he is living with heart failure. So how do we define hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in year 2021? It is a globally prevalent common genetic disorder with autosomal dominant inheritance and the prevalence can be as high as one in 200, depending on how you screen these patients. And by definition, the wall thickness should be at least 15 millimeter in separatic cases, and at least 13 millimeter in family members of patients with HCM. And it is important to rule out other diseases that might be causing the underlying left ventricular hypertrophy. Phenotypic variation is seen in these patients. Not everyone has the same LV morphology. Some patients have only significant hypertrophy of the proximal septum. Some patients will have asymmetric hypertrophy of the whole septum. Some patients will have hypertrophy that is confined mainly to the apex. And some patients will have neutral or concentric hypertrophy as well. About two thirds of patients with HCM have LVO2 obstruction, and that is by definition an LVO2 gradient above 30 millimeter mercury. And presence of LVO2 obstruction, as you can see here, is associated with worse outcomes, including higher mortality, morbidity, including development of heart failure. <clears throat> 
So looking at the historical data, um, the disease was initially described about 60 years ago, back in 1970s. And back then it was described as a rare disease with dismal outcome. The mortality rate in those papers were published to be as high as 6%. That is because the data was a bit skewed at, as this mainly came from tertiary referral centers. Also at the time we did not have effective therapies to treat patients with HCM, importantly defibrillators. Now, in the most recently published uh, literature, we see that the mortality has come down significantly to less than 1%, and that is because we have a better understanding of the disease scores. Also, we have effective therapies, importantly defibrillators. So currently, the mortality is compared to comparable to general U.S. population. So nowadays, we describe the disease as a common contemporary treatable disease that can be compatible with normal longevity. Although over the years, the mortality has come down significantly, we have not really addressed the disease biology itself. So the disease will continue to progress in quite a few patients. And there is an unmet need of heart failure that is quite prevalent in this patient population. Oh, this is a very nice historical timeline. Um, just wanted to show this to you as well. So the disease was again, first described back in 1950s. Dr. Goodwin reported the first surgical myomectomy case in 1960. And Dr. Sherian published the first case that has been shown to, um, to be successfully using the beta blockers in patients with HCM. And then in 1980, the first ICD was implanted in a patient with HCM. And since then, we haven't really had significant advancement in the disease course and the way that we manage these patients until recently, where some disease targeted therapies have been published. And I will go through that in a couple of minutes. I just wanted to show you the current guideline uh, recommendations in terms of medical management of patients with HCM. The recent guidelines were published in AHA HCC, and it was spearheaded by Dr. Steve Oven from Mayo Clinic. So when the patients have obstructive physiology and when they have significant symptoms, then we typically start with beta blockers. And if that is insufficient or not well tolerated, then we switch the patients over to calcium channel blockers, non dihydropyridine And if they fail that or if they have persistent symptoms, then we typically add isoperamide as a second line agent. And if the patients have direct refractory symptoms, then we offer them septal reduction therapies either myomectomy or alcohol septal ablation. In this patient cohort, it is important to remember to avoid vasodilators and positive inotropes such as digoxin, also high dose diuretics as all of these will worsen the LVO2 obstruction and the symptoms as well. And also important to remember that verapamil, although it's very commonly used, can be potentially harmful, especially if the patients have significant dyspnea and high gradients at rest. And I will explain why this is the situation in a couple of minutes. For patients with non-obstructive physiology, they don't have the alveo to obstruction as a therapeutic target, so we have less options to treat these patients. And again, we typically start with beta blockers, and if that isn't sufficient or not well tolerated, then we switch them over to calcium channel blockers. There is no role to use isoperamide in these patients. If they're volume overloaded, then, then we diurese them. And if they have apical variant with significant symptoms, then we can offer them apical myomectomy. And despite all of these, if they have severe persistent symptoms, then their only other option is typically a cardiac transplant. So this was a very nice article that has summarized the current literature that has looked into the traditional guideline directed medical therapies that we have been using for the past 60 years. As you can see here, the data is very, very scarce. There has only been 45 clinical papers published in the past 60 years, about one paper per year, only five randomized clinical trials, and only 2,000 patients involved in these clinical studies as well. So data is very scarce out there. I wanted to show this. This was the original work done um, with non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. I really like this graph because it is well aligned with what we see in clinical practice as well. So we use these medications because they're negative inotropes and they relieve the, the LV. Um, and as you can see here, it does, do, it does work in quite a few patients by decreasing the LVOT gradient. 
and the symptoms as well. However, in other patients, it might paradoxically increase the LVOT gradients and the symptoms. In those patients, it actually causes profound peripheral vasodilation and that worsens the LVOT gradients. And that is an effect that is hard to predict in clinical practice. So we do see worsening symptoms in some patients who take verapamil in clinical practice. What about the data in beta blockers? So this was the original work done several years ago, and we haven't had any additional data since then. Um, so beta blockers are also negative inotropes, and we use them in management of patients with HCM. And as you can see here, they do work by delaying the onset of angina and prolonging exercise duration in patients with HCM. And they also decrease the um, exercise-induced LVOT gradient and improve exercise tolerance in patients with HCM. Again, they're not side effect free, um, especially in younger people. They may not be well tolerated because of fatigue side effects and in elderly individuals, um, heart rate, bradycardia side effect might be a limiting factor as well. So what about diazepiramide? It is a class one antiarrhythmic drug, which is also a negative inotrope. So it does work in reducing the, the LVOT gradients and it does improve patient symptoms in the NYH class, as you can see here as well. But it usually has significant anticholinergic side effects. In this series, about 23% of patients develop side effects, and about 11% of them stop the medication due to side effects. And this is a very common clinical entity that we see in our daily practice as well. What about the data behind the use of septal reduction therapies, including surgical myomectomy and alcohol septal ablation? This was a great paper published in JAK a couple of years ago. Um, it was a meta-analysis that has looked into papers that has reviewed the, the efficacy and safety of both procedures, myomectomy and septal ablation. So they both were proven to be very effective and quite safe as well with very low mortality rates. But in this paper, the data was a bit skewed as the individual studies came from um, centers of excellence with very high procedural volume. Later on, Dr. Kim has published a very important paper in JAMA that has shown that the outcomes do differ based on hospital procedural volumes. Here, um, as you can see, these are the outcomes in septal myomectomy centers, and these are outcomes in alcohol septal ablation centers, um, including death and other uh, complications, pacemaker replacement, stroke and bleeding, and kidney failure. These were centers with a volume in the first quartile, second quartile, and third quartile. So higher volumes are associated with lower mortality and other complications as well. And lower volumes are associated with increasing complication rate. This is why in the recent guidelines, there has been a very strong emphasis to refer these patients to comprehensive centers of excellence, especially if they need an invasive procedure to reduce the complication rate. And Emory is one of the comprehensive centers of excellence. So just to wrap it up, um, again, the current medical therapies can be inadequate and poorly tolerated in some patients, and they don't alter the natural course. They mainly focus on symptom management. This is why we continue to see disease progression in about 10 to 20% of patients, and about 5% of patients with HCM develop end-stage heart failure. And when we look at the septal reduction therapies, they do help in patients with refractory, direct refractory symptoms, but they do carry a risk that is inherent to uh, being an invasive procedure. And they do require expertise that is not universally available. Not every patient have access to it. This is why there has been an increasing interest to look at the roadmap of the way that we treat these patients. So again, it is a genetically determined disease caused by these mutations that lead to primary pathophysiological changes, and those lead to secondary remodeling and eventually symptoms of LVH, um, of HCM. So these are the symptoms of HCM that we treat atrial fibrillation, impaired diastology, LVOT obstruction, ischemia, ventricular arrhythmias leading to sudden cardiac death, 
also heart failure. So we have these current therapies and we try our best with these therapies to control patients' symptoms, but we don't necessarily alter the disease progress. So there has been some work actually looking into more focused therapies, disease targeting therapies, um, including genetically targeted therapy, which we're not gonna cover today. There also has been um, an interest in developing myosin modulators, namely mevacamten, that directly altered the early changes in disease biology. So I just wanted to go through uh, the biological basis of HCM before we talk about mevacamten. So we do find um, an identifiable pathogenic or lactopathogenic variant in up to 60% of patients. And the most commonly involved genes are myosin heavy chain and myosin binding protein, um, which are very important proteins in sarcomere, which is the contractile unit of the cardiac uh, myocyte. So the ultimate effect of these mutations is to create excessive actin myosin cross bridging that eventually leads to hypercontractility. I was uh, given this beautiful video from Myocardia, which is the company that makes Mavic Hampton, and I will take the next two minutes to review this video with you. The cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has been largely isolated to the sarcomere, the molecular engine of the heart. Sarcomere is densely packed with actin and myosin filaments. The sliding motion of these filaments produces a contraction and relaxation that comprise every heartbeat. As systole begins, the heads of the myosin molecules bind to the active sites on actin to form a cross bridge. Once bound, the myosin heads swivel or pivot, advancing the actin filament toward the center of the sarcomere. This ratchet-like motion is known as the power stroke. In addition to being a key structural protein, myosin also generates the energy for the power stroke. It does this by converting chemical energy stored in ATP molecules into the mechanical energy of heart muscle contraction. In a healthy heart, actin and myosin interact to produce normal cardiac motion. But in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Dysfunction at the level of the sarcomere leads to excessive contractility and impaired relaxation. The underlying problem becomes clear when we compare the healthy heart with the changes believed to occur in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In the healthy heart, 40 to 50% of the myosin heads are in a resting or inactive position described as the off state. In contrast, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is believed to be caused by a shift in this ratio with only 15 to 20% of the myosin heads being in this off state. As a result, too many cross bridges form during each This increases the heart's contractility and impairs relaxation, causing the heart to consume more energy in an unproductive way. Over time, these changes can lead to abnormal cell growth and myocardial fibrosis. Anatomically, the ventricular wall thickens. In obstructive cardiomyopathy, these changes can lead to outflow obstruction as well as systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. In non-obstructive cardiomyopathy, impaired relaxation during diastole is also common. Okay, so as this beautiful video summarizes, again, the main problem caused by these mutations is excessive actin myosin cross bridging that leads to hypercontractility in the myocardium. So as a result of hypercontractility, patients will develop significant left ventricular hypertrophy. And as you can see here, here in this uh, pathology picture, um, they develop significant myocardial disarray and eventually they develop significant myocardial fibrosis that leads to heart failure, also sudden cardiac death by causing arrhythmias. So mevacamten was a molecule that was designed to re reverse this process. It was a first-in-class selective allosteric inhibitor of cardiac myosin. So what it does is it inhibits the actin myosin ATBase and it makes less um, 
myosin has to be available to interact with actin and it reverses this hypercontractile state and puts the sarcomere into a normal state. It is a pure negative inotrope, has a half-life of about 10 days. It has biliary clearance and does not interact with the CYP system in the liver, so has very small risk for drug-drug interactions. So this was a wonderful paper published in Science back in 2016 by Dr. Green. He has developed a, an animal model that has looked into the effect of mevacamten in cardiac myocytes. So with mevacamten, the actin myosin ATPase function has come down significantly. Also, when he looked at the, uh, the pathology slides in these um, animals, as you can see, mevacamten has reversed left ventricular hypertrophy significantly. Even it has significantly reversed the myocardial disarray. So this is off MAVA, on MAVA. It kind of put these disarrayed myocardial fibrils back into the parallel um, orientation again. And it also has significantly decreased the amount of fibrosis in the myocardium. So with that, there has been an interest to test MAVA in, in clinical practice. Um, so the initial trial was designed to answer this question, does Mavacampton use reduced LVOT gradient and improve symptoms in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and obstructive physiology? So this beautiful paper was published in Annals in 2019. This was Pioneer HCM trial. It was a phase two proof of concept, non-randomized, open-labeled, dose-ranging study. This was a 12-week trial, and they had two cohorts in the trial. They included patients with NYH class 2 and 3 symptoms, and in each cohort, there was about 10 patients, small trial. And in cohort A, patients were on a higher dose of mevacamten, and in this cohort, they were not allowed to be on beta blockers. And in cohort B, patients were on a lower dose of Bemacamten, but they were allowed to be on beta blockers. Now, the primary endpoint was change in post-exercise LVOT gradients in 12 weeks, but they also looked into secondary and exploratory endpoints, including changes in peak VO2, resting well salva LVOT gradients, LVEF, patient reported dyspnea scores, NYH class, as well as NT pro BNP levels. So here is the uh, summary statement slide. Um, again, this is cohort A. Remember, these were the patients on higher dose of MAVA. This is cohort B. These were the patients on lower dose of MAVA and beta blockers. Here's the change in resting LVEF. There was a bit more drop in cohort A by about 15% mean compared to a lesser drop in cohort B by about 6% mean. And when we look at the resting LVOT gradients, it dives down early in cohort A and stays low the entire time, whereas there is some fluctuation to it in cohort B. And in cohort A, when we look at the post-exercise LVOT gradients, it does come down significantly from a mean of 113 to 19 millimeter mercury at the end of the trial. In cohort B, we don't really see a significant drop in gradient until week four, where there was a dose escalation. And then the gradients came down modestly in cohort B. So there were improvements in secondary endpoints as well, including peak VO2, VCO2, patient reported dyspnea scores, as well as NYH functional class. So this was a very interesting piece of data um, that was published in the same paper as well. So when they looked into uh, the dyspnea scores and LVOT gradients, and this, this particularly came from cohort B patients, um, there was a significant improvement in dyspnea by week four. But when we look at the LVOT gradient change, we don't see a significant drop in LVOT gradient by week four. Patients actually continue to have fluctuations throughout the trial. So that means the dyspnea improvement was not explained by the LVOT reduction per se. There was probably other beneficial myocardial changes that necessarily was not only confined to a reduction in the LVOT gradient in this patient population. <clears throat> 
And then the next clinical question came up was, does Mavicam 10 improve functional capacity and reduce symptoms in a blinded placebo control setting? Uh, this wonderful paper came out recently, Explorer HCM, um, that was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three clinical trial that was um, led by Dr. Olivodo. And the purpose was to investigate the safety and efficacy of Mavicamten in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, obstructive physiology, and symptoms as well. So they had about 250 adults with obstructive HCM with an LVOT gradient above 50 millimeter mercury and MyH class 2 and 3. And these patients were randomized to either Mavicamten or placebo in a one-to-one -one fashion. It was a 30-week trial, and there was a washout period as well. Patients on MAVA were started on a once-a-daily dose of five milligram of MAVA, and there were certain points where there was a dose escalation. A dose was adjusted to achieve a target reduction in LVOT gradient to less than 30. And MAVA plasma concentration was kept between certain ranges. And Pioneer trial that was published previously helped the investigators achieve these specific goals for the Explorer HCM trial. It was a very labor intensive trial Everyone had CPAT at the beginning and end of the trial, and they had serial measurements of echoes and stress echoes and EKGs and halters, and everyone had a cardiac MRI at the beginning and end of the trial as well. So the primary composite endpoints was a um, it was an improvement of at least 1.5 ml per kick per minute in peak VO2 and at least one NYH class reduction, or by about three ml per kick per minute improvement in peak VO2 and no worsening of NYH class symptoms. And they also looked into secondary endpoints and changes in LVOT gradient, patient reported symptoms, as well as NYH class. So when we look at the initial patient characteristics, mean age was about 58, Younger patients' recruitment were, was not great in this trial. As we can expect, you know, young patients are kind of busy with their careers and their life, and this was a very labor-intensive clinical trial. Both genders will, were equally represented in the clinical trial, and it was a white dominant population. Minorities were unfortunately underrepresented in this cohort. And almost everyone were either on a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. And um, most patients had NYH2 class, about a third have had NYH3 class symptoms at the beginning of the trial. Their left ventricles were hyperdynamic with an LVEF of 75%, and they had quite thick ventricles with a mean LV wall thickness of, of about two centimeter. And they had pretty high gradients. When we look at the post-exercise mean gradient at rest, it was about 86 millimeter mercury. So when we look at the primary endpoint in both groups, here as we can see about 37 patients in MAVA and 17 patients in placebo group has met the primary endpoint. And about 20 patients in MAVA and eight patients in placebo group has both had an improvement of at least three ml per kick per minute in peak VO2 and at least one NYH class symptom improvement. And the, the, the difference was very significant. Also, I may have looked into the secondary endpoints. There were significant differences um, in the MAVA group. There was significant improvement in patient reported symptoms as well as their NYH class. So here is a summary of the LVOT gradients and the EF. So when we look at the LVOT gradients, here is post-exercise LVOT gradients, resting LVOT gradients, and Valsalva LVOT gradients. As we can see, there is a significant reduction in the gradients in patients on MAVA, which is blue. And here, when we look at the post-exercise LVOT gradients, there was a mean reduction from 85 millimeter mercury to 38 millimeter mercury at the end of the trial. And about 50% of patients had an LVOT gradient less than 30 
that by definition is non-obstructive HCM at the end of the trial. And also strikingly about a third of patients ended up with a, um, a gradient that was less than 30, also NOH class one symptoms. So symptomatically, phenotypically, these patients were kind of disease free at the end of the clinical trial. Um, also looking at the change in EF, which is a very important parameter to note. Um, this is a negative inotrope. We do expect a drop in EF, but we don't want that drop to be too much. So there was a modest drop in LVEF by about 5% in MERA group compared to the placebo group. And to me, that was reassuring as well. And when they had looked into the mean difference in subgroup analysis, um, all of the subgroups have favored use of mevacamten, as we can see here. Interestingly enough, beta blocker use, as you can see in this box, seem to have attenuated the effect of MEVA on primary endpoint. And that was probably because of the heart rate dependent variables in CPATH. When they have looked into the heart rate independent variables in CPATH, there was no significant difference in patients on and off beta blockers. And again, looking at the patient uh, NYH class, functional class, most patients at the beginning of the trial had class two and three symptoms, and a significant proportion at the end had class one symptoms. Also looking at the biomarkers of cardiac remodeling, there was a significant reduction in both nt BNP over time, as well as high sensitive troponins. So I wanted to show the safety data. This is gonna be a little bit of a busy slide because I wanted to show, show it all as this is a very important parameter to look into. This is a new drug, it's a negative inotrope. So safety is very important. Uh, when they have looked into the adverse events in both groups, there was no significant difference. Importantly, there was no congestive heart failure or sudden death in MEVA group. And there was one of those in, um, in placebo group. And about 97% of the patients have com completed to the trial and five patients had prematurely discontinued the medication. And three of those were on, uh, stopped the medication because of adverse events. Two of them were on MAVA. They had AFib and syncope. One patient was on placebo and that patient has sudden cardiac death. And two patients withdrew, one in each group. Five patients had a protocol-driven temporary discontinuation of the medication for an EF drop of less than 50 during treatment period. Three patients were in MAVA, two were in placebo, and they did recover their EF during the washout period. And four additional patients who were on MAVA had a temporary medication discontinuation for an EF drop less than 50% at the end of the treatment period and EF recovered in all three patients but one who was reported to have a procedural complication and EF drop after AFib ablation. There was no treatment differences in lab values, EKGs or vitals, including heart rate and blood pressure from baseline. So overall, the safety profile was quite favorable. Um, and I kind of found this very reassuring and the medication was very effective in reducing the LVOT gradients and improving patient symptoms in this um, paper with Explorer HCM data. From the same cohort, they had also published the cardiac MRI results. Um, here, as we can see, um, this is the change in mean left ventricular volume in mass index. There was a significant reduction of mass index in patients on MAVA compared to placebo. The LV wall thickness improved significantly by about 2.4 millimeter in patients on MAVA compared to placebo. Left atrial volume has shrank on patients on MAVA. And there was a modest reduction in LVEF by about 6% in patients on the Vicampton as well. They did not show a significant difference in the LV scar burden. But again, this was a 30 week trial, probably a little early to show a significant reduction in the um, LV scar burden. There is a long term trial that is currently being designed 
that will include cardiac MRI data of, of about over about five years in patients with HCM on Mavacamten. They have also published echo data. They have looked into um, parameters of LV relaxation and filling pressures. So there was significant improvement in LV mass index on patients in MABA, and the left atrial volume has shrank significantly, and um, diastolic parameters and filling pressures have improved significantly in patients on Mavacamten as well. So with these very favorable um, outcomes in patients with obstructive physiology, there also has been an interest to look into MAVA in patients with non-obstructive physiology. Uh, this was looked at the Maverick trial, which was just like the Pioneer trial. This was a phase two placebo-controlled dose-ranging study. It was published in JAK just a couple of months ago, and the primary endpoint was safety and tolerability of MAVA in patients with non-obstructive physiology. They had about 80 patients. This was a 16-week trial, and the design was just like Pioneer. It was a dose-ranging proof-of-concept uh, trial um, to also look at the, the safety of the medication in this patient cohort. So in this cohort, Mavicamtan was very well tolerated without excess of serious adverse events. There was about 4% reduction in LVEF in MAVA group compared to about 2% three drop in placebo. Five patients in MAVA group had reversal reductions for an EF um, less than 45%. And once the medication was discontinued, their EF had recovered completely. And um, biomarkers did improve significantly. There was no change in functional status or echo markers of diastology, but the trial was not designed to test for those. But the medication was safe and well tolerated in this patient cohort. So to conclude, um, again, over the couple past um, almost 60 years, sudden cardiac death risk in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has come down significantly, um, especially with the use of defibrillators and current therapies as well. But there is an unmet need of prevalent heart failure in this patient cohort. The current pharmacological therapies are typically inadequate, they're unpredictable, and some patients don't tolerate them because of their side effects. And they do control symptoms in a few patients, but they don't necessarily alter disease course in many. And septal reduction therapies are effective, um, but they do require expertise and they're not universally available. Not every patient can have access to them. So there has been a, uh, a recent development of a promising um, pipeline medication called Mavacamten, which is uh, designed to, to alter the disease biology. And FDA has recently designated a breakthrough status to Mavacamten, which will expedite the re review process. So what is next? Um, currently, they are enrolling patients in Pioneer and Explorer ATM for a longer follow-up trial. And um, there is another trial that is being designed called Valor HCM. This trial will involve sicker patients with symptoms, class three, four symptoms, who are eligible for septal reduction therapies. And they will look and see if Mavacamten use delays or decreases the need of septal reduction therapies in this patient cohort. Again, there is a long-term cardiac MRI paper um, trial being designed at this moment, and um, they are also designing a phase three clinical trial in patients with non-obstructive HCM to look into more clinically uh, meaningful variables in patients with non-obstructive physiology. There has also been an interest to test this drug in patients with HFPEF, especially these patients with hypertensive heart disease, very thick ventricles, small cavity. Um, some of them have, have LVOT gradients as well, midventricular gradients, to see if Mavicamten might benefit in these patients as well. There is a group in UPenn um, which is currently designing a trial to look into this patient population as well. And in terms of our center, as Emory Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center, we have developed an internal registry. Um, we currently have about 6,000 patients that we have seen over the past 20 years. It's a very big registry, and I'm hoping to uh, 
present our internal outcomes in an upcoming grand round conference. And we also have submitted an application to enroll our patients in the ongoing clinical trials as well. With that, I'm gonna thank to these amazing physicians who have been caring for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in our HCM center over the past several years. And I wanted to specifically thank Dr. Williams for mentoring me and taking care of patients with HCM. All right, well, Tad, I'll, I'll take any questions that you might have and thank you for listening. Great, thank you, Aslam. That was fantastic and a very nice uh, review as well as lots of new information. So thank you for, for presenting. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, um, uh, go ahead and type them in the chat box or text me. Um, I'll start off with a question. I'm glad that you um, uh, talked about HEFPEF because you know, as I look at the date, what, what Meva Campton was doing in terms of the parameters that it was changing, the question that came to my mind is, for patients who have hypertension-related hypertrophy, is there hypercontractility as well? Like, have they looked at, you know, the, the little myosin heads that you showed and increased sort of binding? Is that the same thing that's happening in, you know, severe sort of diastolic dysfunction and, and um, uh, HEFPEF patients? Yes, yeah, so especially in that subgroup, you know, there, there is some other patients with HEFPEF, which don't have that hypertensive heart disease, but in the ones with significant left ventricular hypertrophy, the mechanism is quite similar. That is why this group in UPEN will look into that patient cohort to see if the, the medication would work for those patients as well. Yeah, and it was good. Uh, one of the challenges with every time, I don't do HERS very much, but whenever I do it, you know, you're trying to increase the beta blocker or calcium channel blocker in a HOCAM patient and the blood pressure is always the, the limiting issue. You know, you can't, blood pressure is getting kind of low. So it was nice to see that this drug didn't seem to have much of a change in um, heart rates or blood pressure. So it reminds me a little bit of ranolazine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in, in that regard. Very true, very true. So again, that's the main limitation with the current medications that we use. You now, most patients don't, many patients don't tolerate them because as you mentioned, the drop in blood pressure and the heart rate is a limiting factor as well. We'll see, this medication does not seem to do that, so. Yeah. Okay, there's a question from Dr. Chang. Um, says, nice talk. Uh, in phase two trial, a uh, high dose mavacamptin was not used with beta blocker. In phase three trials and clinical practice, uh, will beta blockers be discontinued? So in the phase three trial, um, the, the medication, the beta blockers were allowed to be used with the mevacamptan. And when we look at the data, the, the efficacy is pretty high with and without beta blockers. Um, I don't exactly know the answer to your question, but my inclination would be to try both. You know, if the patients are are doing well on a uh, on a beta blocker and they need a second line agent, then we can potentially use that uh, medication as a second line agent. But if they don't tolerate beta blockers to begin with, then we can use mevacampin as a de novo agent as well. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, Pooja, can I interject real quick? Yes, I, yes. I agree. First of all, great talk, Oslam, uh, and and I agree. I, I think. Likely beta blockers will be, my guess is beta blockers will become second line therapy in these patients that are able to afford and tolerate and take Mavicampton when it, when it does come out. Um, and I, I just also want to take this opportunity to thank Oslam for uh, her help and the great job she's done seeing a lot of our HCM patients over the past year and a half. And also, like she said, organizing our database, which was in sore need being an organized and also another plug for Oslin. She's done a fantastic job organizing the ECHO teaching curriculum for the fellows as well. So thanks again, Oslin, for a great talk. Thank you, Robbie, for your mentorship as well. There's a question from uh, Dr. Sherman. Um, he's uh, asking about any long-term side effects. So, you know, you presented up to like 30 months. So what do we know about long-term effects with this drug? No, we don't know. The patients in the Pioneer trial and Explorer HCM trial are currently being enrolled into a long-term phase follow-up. So we'll, we'll have an answer to our question hopefully in the next year or two, Dr. Sherman. Mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll just quickly say also systolic heart failure obviously is the big 
long-term concern with this drug. And I think that's what everyone is sort of holding their breath to make sure it's see so far so good short-term, but obviously that's the, the big long-term worry with this drug. That's true. I think what the data has shown that, you know, in, in about seven to eight patients, there was a transient reduction in LVEF. Thankfully in the Explorer cohort, there was no uh, clinical heart failure in, in patients on MAVA. And my, my guess is that, you know, these are clinical trials and things are being, being done in a, in a rapid fashion. I think in, in real clinical practice, we're gonna dose up titrate MAVA in a, in a way smaller fashion, in a way uh, slower fashion. So I think um, that will probably prevent drops in EF. We're gonna be more careful and you know, we're gonna do serial echocardiograms and we're gonna change the dose um, probably after several months as well. Um, that hopefully will, will reduce the rate of reductions in the LVEF. There's a, a question from uh, Dr. Taylor. Uh, how is this new drug specific for cardiac versus skeletal and smooth muscle sarcomere? Yeah, great question, Dr. Taylor. I don't know the answer. Um, I don't know the, the biology of the skeletal muscle tissue, um, but I know that this is specifically designed to target actin myosin ATPase which should only be present in the cardiac muscle, but I'm not sure if it has been tested in the skeletal muscle tissue as well. I, I can look it up and certainly get back to you. Dr. Taylor, you'd have to call your friend, Dr. Seidman and ask her who helped develop it, but I believe it is, I believe it was targeted specifically for cardiac specific cross bridging, but uh, I agree with Ozma. There's been no reported that I've seen uh, you know, skeletal muscle uh, issues in patients that have taken this drug in the trials. Thank you, Robbie. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about when to order a cardiac MRI uh, in this population? So when you when you see somebody who has HOCAM based on echo, you know, when it's a clear cut case, you say, oh, yes, high gradients, you have HOCAM, we've explained your dyspnea. But you know, when, when does the cardiac MRI, do you order it very often? Uh, you know, obviously if you're looking for SCAR, you might, but uh, tell me a little bit about that. Sure, sure, definitely. So I love cardiac MRI because especially from my experience compared to echo, the, um, the accuracy of measuring the wall thickness, but also importantly, evaluating the mitral valve pathology is great with cardiac MRI. And those are things that we can miss with echo. So the way that I utilize MRI is, especially if I have a clinical diagnostic question at the beginning, right, if the echo is insufficient, not great quality, if I'm not convinced whether or not this patient has HCM, then I use cardiac MRI as a confirmatory test for diagnostic purposes. Also, um, before sending patients for septal reduction therapies, if I'm not convinced that what I see in terms of mitral valve morphology in patients um, with the echo, then I do get a cardiac MRI to carefully look at the mitral valve morphology, make sure that we're not missing primary mitral valve pathology um, that can be addressed potentially during myonectomy uh, surgery as well. Also, as you have mentioned, we do use it for sudden cardiac death risk assessment um, in patients. I do use it very often and I find it very helpful. Okay, great. Uh, there's a question from uh, Dr. Dickert. Uh, from a mechanistic perspective, what is the primary mechanism thought to be regarding the transition to the burned out phase? Uh, they have obviously been attentive to ensuring that the drug doesn't accelerate this, but is there real hope that it will help? Yeah, so I think mechanistically, the main problem with the burned out phase is significant uh, scar burden. Um, when we look at the, the way that this medication works, um, especially in the animal models, it did decrease the scar burden significantly. Uh, we haven't shown that effect in the Ex Explorer trial, uh, but I think uh, if you give it long enough, then it might eventually decrease the scar burden in human tissue as well. And that can decrease the rate of, um, of burned out hypertrophic cardiomyopathy development. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic with that. Did they, did they do MRIs in the uh, Explorer? They did, they did. So sure, they, I, I think I had the um, oh, okay. 
I missed that. So that means that they might have been able to look at um, sort of fibrosis or early fibrosis if they did. So no, they did. They did look at the fibrosis. That there was no significant change in fibrosis. Mm -hmm. But again, this was only a thirty-week trial, right? I mean, seeing these patients in clinical practice, I don't think we would anticipate a significant improvement in fibrosis in only about 30 weeks. There is another trial which will recruit patients for five years and they will follow up them with MRIs as well. I think that might show a reduction in the fibrosis burden. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, not necessarily a reduction in fibrosis, but uh, basically attenuation compared to the placebo group. Meaning, you know, if the placebo group progressed and uh, the Mavicampton group stayed the same in terms mm -hmm. of fibrosis. Yeah, they did not really have that observation, but they, there's, there was definitely significant improvement in other LV parameters, the wall thickness, left atrial size, and diastolic parameters as well. So we'll see what this long-term paper shows in terms of the, um, the other MRI findings. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.